my distinct honor to introduce to you uh, Mr. Jim Hart and Mr. Martin, what rank did you get to? Major. Major Martin from the, from the Army. And so he's going to be with us today. Yeah, he's, like I said, he's he was fought in World War II and got a little bit of political background in Alabama as well. So he has a lot of interesting stories. Had the opportunity to teach Millie a few years ago, which he was a pleasure to have. So, Mr. Martin, the floor is yours. And you start wherever you like and run from there. Well, first place, I want to join the class. Am I too old? <laughs> <laughs> well, I graduated from high school in 1936. I was born September the 1st, 1980. How old am I? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a history class, not mathematics. <laughs> Well, at any rate, I'm 97. <laughs> when you're 97, you're not quite as far as you were when you were 18. Now, I entered this beautiful school building, and my mind went back to the first school I went to. I was eight years, I was six years old, yeah, six years old. The little house we lived in was a little small house, four rooms, no electricity. No running water. Had a well on the back porch to pump water. Had an outhouse where you could beat it. No heat in the house except a big stove in the kitchen and a fireplace in one room. Now that's how it was. There was no electricity in most of Alabama. Now think of that. You go in the grocery store, no electricity. Go in the Drug store or the department store, carry a lamp. No electricity. The school I went to, and I always remember it because when I first got there, I was amazed to see that half of it was log cabin. Left over from the original school, it was all log cabin. Of course, the school had no electricity, it had no running water. Every room had a big stove you built a fire in to heat it. But it was a good school. The teachers were strict, they were well. I remember them all very fondly. Uh, I've always been an admirer of school teachers because what you are now and what you learn is what you're going to be when you're my age. I graduated from high school in 1936. I remember it well because a depression was on. Times were very lean and hard. Money was tight. Jobs were hard to get. My father was a locomotive engineer. He only got paid when he made a run with the train. And with the depression, there weren't that many trains running. So it was tight everywhere, money-wise. After I graduated, I had a friend we called Jamie Swindle. Jamie and I had biceps. We both had a paper route. So we were wealthy. We made about $3 a week. And I thought, my goodness, I'm pretty, pretty well off $3 every week. That's how I bought my bicycle. And I delivered my papers at the school. Jamie says, Jim, I think I'll join the Army. You are? Why? Well, I don't see a way to get a job, so I'm going to join the Army. He said, I want to join the Air Force. And that was part of the Army. I said, all right. I didn't see him for 40 years. Next time I heard from him, I was a congressman. I had an appointment with President Johnson. And I went in the president's office, he put his arm around my shoulder, he said, Jim, I know all about you. J.B. told me how you used to deliver papers with him. J.B., Mr. President, who are you talking about? J.B. Swindle. He's pilot of Air Force One. You mean a boy from Jefferson County High School got to be the best airplane pilot? in the whole United States? That's right. He 
he said to him, I was holding J.B.'s Bible when I was sworn in for president. It had some blood on it. President Kennedy had been shot. J.B. went to help him. It had his Bible in his hand and blood got on it. And he said, I put my hand on that Bible and swore to be president of the United States. J.B. Swindle is now deceased. He was a full colonel and flew planes during the war. Well, J.B. was just one of many. When I had a reunion with my class, I said, what did you do? He said, I was on a submarine, a submarine that goes deep under the ocean looking for a German ship to destroy. Did you destroy any? Oh, yes, we did. He said, one day I put my periscope up, and I looked, and that was a big German ship. Got my submarine in position, reached my hand, and fired a torpedo. And he said, I was watching it travel through the water, and hit that German ship, and it exploded, and it sunk. Then I said, I went for the second one. And the third one, I got called back to the United States. And another man took my place. And he was commander of that same submarine. And he went out on the coast, and he saw a German ship. But it was a warship, a German battleship, big, strong. He thought, I've got four torpedoes in my submarine. I'm going to fire two. Bam! Bam! Both of them hit. The ship, though, before it was hit, dumped two big barrels of explosive over their shoulders. Those barrels fell down by the submarine. They exploded. It ripped a hole in the submarine. Water began to pour. Those young men couldn't get out. The ship slowly sank. They're still at the bottom of the ocean. War is tough. War is terrible. And you've got to be strong to do it. Now, when I joined the Army as a private, I went to Fort McClellan. First thing they did, they gave me a good haircut. It took two minutes for the clippers to go over. All of a sudden, my hair was about an inch and a half long. Next thing, they gave me a uniform. Big heavy boots, khaki, shirt and pants. I'm pretty well dressed. Gave me a tie. Sitting at Fort McClellan. I went to bed tired that night and I was in my bunk. I felt somebody tapping on my foot. Sergeant says, congratulations, Private Martin. You've just been elected to be head of the kitchen. You'll be washing all of the plates. I report to the kitchen at 4 o'clock in the morning. Woo! I didn't know I was get a promotion the first day, but I remember how many plates that were long, long aluminum plates. That must have been $200. And I worked and worked and worked. And when I got through, I thought I'd go back. He said, no, we've got to clean up. We've got to clear the tables, mop the floors, clean the stove, and get ready to serve a new meal. Well, I got promoted. I did that. Well, first thing I knew, they said, you've been assigned to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. You're going to be in the artillery. Artillery. Why am I in the artillery? Well, artillery is a complicated thing. If you've got your cannon and you're going to fire a target four miles away, if you make the slightest mistake, you're going to miss the target. All mathematics. You made the top grade in your test. We have a 47 men, and you made the top grade. So we're going to send you to Officer Kennedy School. Where's that? Fort Sale, Oklahoma. He said, Now let me tell you, there'll be 1,000 of you in the class but only 500 of you will graduate. I got on the train. We finally got to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, a fort way out in the desert where it used to be when the cavalry was in charge. 
And I went to my assigned house and had a bunk with four beds in it. Had three other men in it. One from Massachusetts, one from Kansas, one from Nebraska. And I was the southern. We got along well. We went from class to class to class. One class I was having trouble with. Mathematics. <coughs> High mathematics. I thought I wasn't going to pass. <coughs> One day I heard, as I was sitting in class, I heard the jingles of the boot on the tack offs. He wore a long campaign hat, boots, spurs. You had to sit up this way. Mr. Mark. Yes, sir. You didn't finish your assignment. Why not? I didn't have enough time. What time did you go to bed? Twelve o'clock. What time did you get up? Four o'clock. How do you expect to win in this apartment if you're going to sleep all the time? Ooh. I thought this was going to be tough. But I graduated. 500% back. I was made a second lieutenant. Sent to Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. I learned first hand how to fire artillery. They put me in the field and we fired shell after shell and gun after gun. 105 Howard's. Now Howard's shoots at an angle. So you could go over hills, you could go over anything that's in your way. But a gun shoots straight. The Howard's was difficult to fire because it's complicated. You've got to figure out how the heat rises your shell and how the strong wind puts it over. All of that is mathematics. Study after study after study. Because you're either going to Japan or you're going to Germany. And you're either going to get killed or you're going to win. If you want to win, you've got to listen to what we say. All right, good. I've got a chance to get promotion. I got promoted to first lieutenant. Ooh, had a little more responsibility. But I had a two weeks vacation. I had an old Buick car that I purchased. I drove from Louisiana to Birmingham to my mother and father. While I was there, I got a telegram. Captain Martin, you have been promoted to captain. You're to go to Fort, Fort uh, in Mississippi, Fort Shelton. You're going to be in command of one battery of artillery. <coughs> Ooh, I'm suddenly in command. I drove to Camp Shelby. I found where Battery A was located. The colonel came and he said, Now, Captain, you've been assigned four sergeants, no, 12 sergeants. Each sergeant will have a large truck. You're going to go to Hattiesburg, Mississippi. At 8 o'clock in the morning, a train will arrive. The first 150 men that are called off will be in your battery. So you're going to have to have a sign that says Battery A, A-67 Field Artillery Battalion. I had that. The train stopped. You got on. What's your name? Albert Smith. Where are you from? Nebraska. And what's your name? Our name. Your name. 150 of them. Line up. Who's been working in the kitchen before? Who's worked in a quick eating place? You have? Step out. And what did you do? I worked at the hotel, cooking, ooh, jump out. Finally, I had four cooks. I said, let me tell you, we've got 150 men to feed tonight. All four of you go to the kitchen, you'll find a mess sergeant there that'll show you, and you've got to start learning to cook <coughs> and have breakfast ready in the morning at 6 o'clock. You understand that? Yes, sir. Get going. Two and a half years we worked. We 
We learned every day. We fought our cannons. We got ready. One day the colonel came in and said, Captain Martin, we've got our orders. We're going to Europe. We're going by train to New Jersey the day after tomorrow. Get your men ready. Get them packed. Let them notify their families. And get ready to go. Next thing I know, we're on the train going to New York. We're actually stopping in New Jersey. We got off and went to the headquarters. Gentlemen, you're going to Europe and you're going to join, join General Patton's army. You'll be in combat within a month after you land in Europe. Be prepared for it. Yes, sir. We got on a big ship. That ship had been captured from the Italians. It was a luxury liner with this strip roll of luxury out, fill it full of monks. That big ship started. The commander got on the microphone. Gentlemen, we do not have a convoy to protect us. But I want you to know this ship goes faster than the German submarine. And we've got men out looking for German submarines, and if he sees one, we're going to outrun him. Now we're going north, up towards the North Pole. From where the icebergs are, German submarines can't operate. Day after day, we sail north. One day, I heard my name called over the loudspeaker. Captain Mark, report for the day. Yes, sir. Tonight, you'll be on duty. As a watcher, is a pair of strong binoculars. Keep searching the ocean surface. If you see a submarine periscope, pull this whistle immediately. If you see an iceberg that's big and you think it's dangerous, call it to the attention of the commander. We saw those icebergs. We never saw a submarine. One day the ship turned. And the cap captain says, you're now going into warm waters. We sailed and sailed, and one day somebody said, land. England. We're supposed to land in England. No, the commander said, we've just got a call from France. The American army have driven the Germans out of the harbor. France. And we're going to be the first ship to land there. And we kept going until we saw France. Got to that harbor. All of a sudden, the trip, ship came to a stop. It stopped, shook. The commander said, Gentlemen, there is a German ship that has been sunk, and we run into it below. We can't go any further. So we've ordered landing craft to come and get you and take you to shore. Yes, finally I saw those flat landing craft with the front that would lie down so the soldiers could get off. The ship was very high, high as the ceiling. And there was a big rope ladder, ropes this way or that way. They rolled it over the side. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. The snow and the sleep was terrible. Put my hands on that rope, and because it was wet and moist, the rope was frozen. But the captain always says, follow me. And I started down that rope ladder. I looked up, and I saw my men coming. Looked like they were doing well. But all of a sudden, I heard my name called. Captain Martin, yes. Chidensky's up at the top. He's scared. He's just sitting up there shaking. He won't come down. Oh, I'll go see. I climbed back up the ladder. Zeninsky was holding on. He was shaking. I said, I know. You're, you're afraid of this. Let me tell you, I am too. But let's go down together. When I make a step, you make a step. We finally got to the bottom. The wind was blowing so hard, the ship was going that way, and so was the landing craft, and you had to step off that ladder into the landing craft. Zedinsky got there, and he said, Captain Martin, I can't do that. <laughs> yes, you can. You can do what you're determined to do. And if you're determined to get off, you'll get off. Now, I'm your captain. I'm 
Fed and Europe. Gallup, yes, sir. he steps in. Somebody grabbed him and helped him, and we started toward the shore. All of a sudden, a landing craft hit something. It was still that German ship that we saw. The man in charge of the landing craft said, Captain Martin, this is far as we can go. I said, well, we're a long way from shore. It's 2 o'clock in the morning and it's freezing. He said, I can't help it. You'll have to wait ashore. Ooh. All right, man. Put your guns up in the air. Put your pistols up in the air and get in the water and follow me. I hit that water and I thought, ooh, I don't know whether I'm going to make it or not. <laughs> Snow and sleep were coming across so hard, the waves were hitting me in the face. And somebody said, Zedinsky's about to fall. Oh, God. <laughs> I looked back and then they wouldn't get out of the boat. Well, didn't know. Nothing for me to do but turn around and go back. <laughs> so <Nancy. laughs> follow me. If you don't, I'm going to put you in jail. You understand that? Yes, sir. You want to go to jail or you want to come with me? I want to go with you. <laughs> we got ashore. We're all soaking wet. The wetness of our clothes was freezing. I thought, how are we going to make it? All of a sudden, they told us that big trucks had come to take us to camp. Lucky Strike. Lucky Strike was the name of the cigarette. And he used that as a code name so the Germans wouldn't know where we were going. All right, get in the truck. Now you Yankees, you sing Yankee Doodle Dandy and dance as hard as you can dance. Keep your blood flowing. And you sell them to say, oh, I wish I was in the land of God. Old times there are not forgotten. Sing Dixie and dance. We did that. I think the French saw us going down the road, thought we were crazy, but we were trying to stay alive. Well, when you get to camp, Camp Lucky Strike, you're going to have warm tents to get into. One of them. We drove up to Camp Lucky Strike, and there was where we were to go, and all the tents, just piles of snow. My goodness, what happened? Yesterday, a German plane slipped through our head, through our aircraft, and it went over our kitchen. Killed everybody in the kitchen, grew up the kitchen. So we don't have anybody to cook, no kitchen to cook for you. And we couldn't put up your tents. I went over and picked up the edge of a tent, the concrete, I mean the, <coughs> the tent was frozen solid. The canvas was stiff. I never put up a tent like that. And nobody else had. But we're going to put them up. We struggled until we finally got them up. Then they announced we're bringing us a heater. And what was a heater? It was a bucket about that big full of sand and a hook with a bottle on it to hang it to the top of your tent. And it was full of kerosene. And it would drift down in the sand. And all you had to do was light the sand. Like a stove. We did that. We finally got the tent warm and we finally got in our bedroom. We tried to get some sleep. But all of a sudden I heard the bugle. Get up. Captain up full time. Get up. We're going to breakfast. What is breakfast? We got down there and said breakfast hasn't arrived yet. It's coming. Well, the kitchen destroyed. Where's breakfast coming from? We don't know, <clears throat> but it's coming with big tubs of oatmeal. And you'll have some powder to make milk of. 
About an hour later, we see this truck's coming. Big barrels of hot oil. They had, well, you've got your aluminum mess kit to eat out of. It's cold. So they had a, a barrel of hot water. Dip it in and get it warm, because if you put that oatmeal in that cold aluminum eating place, it'd get cold immediately. We did that. Everybody else out that aluminum eating facility, and they dip that oatmeal in it. Over here, they take a dried milk, mix it up, pour it over your oatmeal, and you line it up and went away. You sat down on the ground, or anywhere you want to sit. That old meal was pretty good. They announced that we had some K rations coming for the afternoon meal. Box about that big. That big had a meal in it. A pretty good meal. <coughs> the next morning, I heard my name called. <phone rings> Captain Martin, yes. We had gone on the front lines, saw off in Germany. You've been selected to lead the way to take the path to find out when we get there where to put our people, where to put our cowards in place. You will meet a <coughs> lieutenant colonel in Metz, France. <coughs> Metz was, <coughs> excuse me, Metz was a city that used to be in Germany. But after World War I, it was given to France. And the people in Metz still spoke German. And then we were warned that, look, you're going to be in meds, but you got to remember these people were Germans, and they still side with the German army. Don't let them get the best of them. All right, sir, I'll drive. So I started off with 12 vehicles behind me. I had the map. It was snowing still. The Red Ball Express, which was the best way to get fuel back and forth. It was going so fast, I was having trouble even seeing it. We kept going. We kept going. Finally, I saw St. Stephen's Cathedral way up in the air. Pull over there. Let's take a break. Fill your vehicles up with gasoline. Get yourself relaxed. Because we've still got almost 100 miles to go. We finally got back on the road. We went 100 miles. It was midnight when I got to Med France. I saw nothing. But I heard it was this boom, 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 boom. I knew that was German artillery landing on our side, and our side was flying. So I said to myself, where am I going to spend the night with my men? Oh, thank you. Where are we going to spend the night? Well, the sergeant says, Captain, we've just gotten the city away from the Germans, and all these hotels around here are empty. Picked you out a hotel. Well, I looked around, I saw the Majestic Hotel. Big, beautiful building. Went up to the door. It was locked. What do you do when the door is locked? It's 12 o'clock at night and your men are freezing. I didn't have but one choice. I reached in my left shoulder, got my big heavy duty 45 pistol, aimed at that lock, pop! Lock flew, <coughs> but it didn't open. Pop! It didn't open. Wait for me. 
I got in my seat. I went to meet that colonel and he wasn't there. Oh, goodness. Well, where were you might be? I asked the MP, was there? He said, I think he went to Luxembourg. I saw a sign, Luxembourg. We started down that road. And all of a sudden, I saw a vehicle with our battalion number on it. Lieutenant Kerman. Yes. Oh, you Captain Martin? Yes. Pull over the side of the road. Kerman, have you got our instructions? Yes, I have. Follow me. We went winding down the hill. Finally came to an old torn up factory. Top was blown off where American bombers had dropped off. He said, that's going to be your headquarters. Oh, that looks good. I looked at that place. It was nasty and filthy. The snow was on it. Men had been there before. Now put A battery here, B battery there, and C battery there. All three had four powers. I could call on one at a time or get all four of them at one time, which would be 12 hours. Start putting the men in place. Finally, the B-Baker came up. I got a call on my radio from Lieutenant Fraser, whom I knew well. He said, Captain Martin, there's a German mine where you told me to put our cannons. I said, just put a stick of it and wrap some toilet paper around it so people will see it. Captain, I've been to mine school. I know how to demine that. I should have told him no, but I didn't. He went to demine it. It exploded. Boom! Blew his body all to pieces. Captain Martin. Said a freighter's just been killed. Can you come over? I'll be right there. What a horrible thing to take a bag and timber up. Here's a leg. There's his head. Here's part of his body. Put it in a bag. I knew his wife well. They had two children. Her name was Betty. How can I write Betty a letter and tell her what happened to her husband? I cannot tell her how he died. That would simply make her situation worse. I'm going to tell him how brave he was and how he was doing a good job. And he got killed. God bless you. We are Christians. You're a husband. Went to heaven. Son, Captain James D. Martin. It went off. <clears throat> we got in place, got a call from the colonel. Captain Martin, yes. You're to be the intelligence officer of this battalion. Lieutenant Schrader's going to take your place, and we're going to make him a captain. Yes, sir. I went to the headquarters. He said, my telephone's ringing in just a minute. Hello? You say General Patton's going to be at Vista, Germany, and wants to see us at 2 o'clock? Yes. Boom. Colonel turned around to me and said, Captain, you and I are going to Vista, Germany, and we're going to leave in an hour. Get ready. We got in our team, we drove down this winding road, came to a little town of Vista, had a square in it. They put a speaking platform up there for General Patton. Had a microphone, a loudspeaker. About 35, 40 of us officers standing around. We commanded all of the 750 men in the battalion. At 2 o'clock, Sharp. In comes General Patton in his vehicle. He jumps out. He had on that steel helmet with three stars.
charge on him. He had his ivory handled pistol that he's well known on. Wearing his boots, big strap across his waist. He got out of that vehicle and I was standing by the steps and he saw I was a captain and he said, I said, God bless you, Captain. He stood his back. Went up to the microphone. Gentlemen, it's now two o'clock. If your watch doesn't say two o'clock, set. Everybody looked at their watch. In the morning, it's seven o'clock. I want all of your artillerymen to fire at any known German target. Well, I was the artilleryman in charge. Seven o'clock in the morning. At 15 minutes of eight, stop. Put your howitzers and attach them to your vehicles and get prepared. We're going to go over the Siegfried Line. And what is the Siegfried Line? It was a concrete steel fortification the Germans built in 1936, 7 and 8, and it stretched 100 miles between the German border and the French border. And the Germans built that to keep the French from coming into Germany. They had it well stocked with food, ammunition, made hospitals, everything under there they needed. And they had big domes where the Germans could shoot at us when we shot at that dome, our bullets just ricocheted on. We're going past it in the morning. Well, we did. We started on the Siegfried line. Everybody had their weapons out. Everybody had their rifle with a bullet in it. Everybody was prepared to shoot. Not the first German that we see. All was quiet. I looked under there and I saw where they had horses. I didn't know the Germans pulled some of their vehicles and guns with horses. Well, they didn't when they went far out. In Germany, where they could save gas, they used big draft horses. All right, men, let's go over the hill. I got to the top of the hill and I said, oh, stop. Ahead of us on that road. A narrow road that had been farm on either side. Snow was still covered, but there was tracks on the road. But the Germans with their horses were stretched out for a long way, pulling those wagons and cannons. But our headquarters had notified the Air Force, and four planes came over with their machine guns firing. <laughs> Well, it's going into those horses and men. I looked down and I saw, whew, what a terrible scene. The fallen horses that fell over, tumbled over the wagons. Wait a minute, I see one woman down there. I put my glasses up to see what she was doing. She had a big carving knife. She was carving meat off of that horse to take feed her children. <coughs> Sergeant, she speak German. Go down and tell that woman she needn't worry about that horse. It's going to be here for some time. We're just going to push it off the side of the road. Now that four horse is still living. Tell her to take that first horse and give it to her husband and say this is a present from the United States Army. I sort of said, yeah, yeah. That pleased her. I see a drop, go over and get that lead horse, and I can close my eyes and see it go to that field. That big old horse prance, a beautiful draft horse. And that woman leading it back. We finally got all that off the road. It took us two hours to push it off with our bulldozer vehicles. I looked at all that terrible situation. A few of the horses were still living, but they were wounded. We can't leave those horses like that. Take your pistols. In their head. Bow! Kill the horse. Keep going. Started up the hill and I said, wait a minute, stop. I see some German soldiers up there. 
put my glasses up, studied them carefully, and I said, you know, they don't have on steel helmets. They don't have any rifles or guns. They're just bailing around. That must be the soldiers that escaped that strength. I see an old man coming on a bicycle. Sergeant, go get him. Bring him over to me. Ask him. Let me tell you something. You're shaking because we're not going to hurt you. But he saw us sitting there with all of our guns and pistols and steel helmets. And he was on the bicycle. He was German. We're Americans. Look. Take your bicycle and drive to that town. Tell those Germans to surrender immediately. Go in a bedroom and get a pillowcase off of a pillow and put it on a broom and hold it high. A white flag that says we surrender. And march towards us single hand, single file. I saw the old man pillow that bicycle. He was ready to go. In about an hour, a white flag's paired up. Here comes a long line of German soldiers. I was sitting in my Jeep, watching them go by. They looked haggard. They were hungry. They were tired. Their country had been completely destroyed by American bombing. The German command couldn't get in touch with their field officers because all of the transmission, telephone wire, electrical wires, all been destroyed. The war was won, but Hitler would not surrender. He was in Berlin at that time, in an underground bunker they could build for himself. Well supplied. His female companion was with him. His officer said, Here, Hitler, surrender. We're losing this war. No. We're going to win this war. Keep fighting. What a horrible mistake. We had to keep going. After I got those men going and told the colonel we've got 18 prisoners marching towards the rear, let's go to the next town. I got to that town and it was vacant. I stopped with my field glasses. I didn't see a soul, not one person. Stores, everything is empty. They knew we were coming, and they decided to leave. All right, let's go. I went into the town. I saw it was empty. A strange feeling to go into town and it's completely empty. Then I heard a sound. Americans! Americans! It's called Americans. Over to the distance, it's faint. Sergeant, turn your jeep and head that direction. Let's be careful. This might be a trap the Germans set for us. But it wasn't. I got to a great big impound, wire and steel covering the whole wall. I looked through the wire and I saw four or five hundred people. All present, the eyes wide open. Americans, Americans. I went to the gate. There was one man there. He was rather small man, gray hair, gray beard. <coughs> he looked at me and he said, "Are you a captain?" I said, "Yes." What is your name? I said, "I'm Captain Martin." What is your name? I'm John Wiggins. Where are you from? Lithuania. How did you get here? Well, I was a college professor. And I was just given a test to my students. And I was taking their papers home to grade them. And I'm walking down the sidewalk. And a big black car comes in, stops. Two men jump out, put my hands behind my back, put handcuffs on me, throw me in that car took me to a boxcar. He said that was 
three years ago. We've been in this prison for three years. Every morning at seven o'clock, we march to that factory. I've got one man going to sleep, and I'm going to wake up. Wake up! He woke up. All the people in that cage had been made prisoners and working in that factory. They fed them very little food. They marched them back to that prison. There was only one bathroom in it. One place to get a drink of water. 500 people. No beds. Step on the floor. No bedrooms. Pick out a spot. In my office. I saw some women who say it used to be beautiful like these girls. Now their face was sunk in from hunger. The hair was broke down and never been killed. Their clothes were ragged and dirty. As I was standing in the fence, I could get a bad odor. Thank you, that. Captain Martin, can you open the gate and let us out? Great big old fashioned lock. I looked at it. The only thing I had on my cheek was a little small shovel and a little small axe. They left for an emergency. That wouldn't open that lock. I thought for a minute. Well, I opened that hotel door with my pistol. Tell everybody to stand back. I'm going to shoot at that lock and see if I can open it. Move everybody back. Sorry, you can go back. Let me try it again. Pop! The lock was that way. The third time I fired, the lock split open. And I started to open the gate. And the old man said, where do we go when we get out, Captain Barton? I said, the Germans abandoned this town. Take over the town. Take over their house, sleep in their bed, bathe in their tub, go in the bakery, get all the food you can find, go in the butcher shop, go in the stores, go in the grocery stores, get everything you want. The German put you in here, now the Germans, but they are going to take care of you. If anybody tries to run you out, Tell all the men to go there and get those pitchforks out of those hay piles. Tell them you're not leaving. You're there because the United States Army put you there. And behind me is coming 15,000 soldiers. If you had any help, just tell them that Captain Martin put you there. I'm leaving. God bless you all. I looked at my waters. I'm going to take another town called Argon. We drove about 15 miles and I saw a sign. Ordo. Stop. Let me look in this field glasses. Big buildings. I see some German soldiers. I called on the front. Load your, load your vehicles. Your cannons, we're getting ready to fire. Load all 12 of them. We're going to knock those buildings down and rescue what we can. I put my glasses on, getting ready to fire, and all of a sudden I saw some women and children moving to another building. I called back. Hold the fire. Again, I saw a German soldier who was somehow dislocated. I sent my men over, bring that German soldier over here. He was like, sorry if you speak German, tell him that we're not going to bother him. But he's going to walk to that building, and he's going to tell the mayor of that town and the commanding officer that they've got one hour 
to vacate, and every German soldier's got to march out and put his rifles down, his pistols down, and I'm going to be watching. In one hour, you can expect our shells to land, and we won't stop until your town's completely destroyed. That's your choice. He marched them out. The soldiers put their guns and pistols down. Started marching toward us. While that was happening, I heard a German machine gun off to my right. Three big birds. <laughs>
put my pistol up and I said, we're Americans. Join them now. Think of that. They had been there dying. And all of a sudden, an American showed up. And what did America mean to them? Freedom. They could come out. <coughs> I walked down the aisle and I saw a horrible sight. Some bums still had a carcass in them that was dead. It was a man there that was a skinny bone. Water. <coughs> Excuse me. What can I do for these people? There must be four or five hundred of them. They're all dying of thirst. Sergeant, go back to Oregon. Tell that mayor to get every man, woman, and child that's big enough to carry a bucket and a dipper and come here and meet him. If they don't, I'm coming back to Oregon. Yes, sir. In about an hour, I saw him coming. Men, women, and children. Old men, women, teenagers. All with their buckets. We've got two fossils here in this concentration camp. Sergeant, you supervise this one, you supervise this one. Fill their buckets three fourths full. Don't fill it full because they've got to climb that ladder to feed that man at the top. We started. In about 30 minutes, the sergeant comes over and says, Captain Martin, that woman says she can't get up that ladder. She's too big. Tell that woman. That's fine. She doesn't have to worry about that. I'm going to let her spend the night here. She's going to have the bunk right here next to her. So she won't be uncomfortable. We're going to tie her to the bunk. And in the morning, she can go up that ladder. When he told that old woman that, she grabbed that bunk and started up there. <laughs> I saw I had a problem. The press was so desperate for a drink of water they grabbed it, different, spilled it. All right, Sergeant, put one man up each ladder, and as they go to one of those people, hold their hands so they can't grab the dipper, and then get them a slowly drink of water. It took us four or five hours to do that. I called back the colonel. Gave him a report. He said, Captain Martin, stay there. I'm going to report that to higher headquarters. But he said, I can't believe what you're telling me. Colonel, I don't believe it either. But I'm standing in the middle of it. All right. I'll call you back. Two hours later, I got the call. General Eisenhower is coming tomorrow. Said, the colonel said, you know, Captain, he's always looking how people are dressed. And can you go back to one of those German houses and kind of straighten yourself up? Said, the last time I saw you, you were looking pretty rugged. Man. I'll go clean up. I went back to Oregon. Saw a beautiful home there. Sergeant go and tell those people that got guests tonight <laughs> for them to move in that neighbor's house. Let's just move in. Sergeant, you take that bedroom, I'll take that bedroom, and you take that one. Let's get a good night's sleep. But I want each of us to do something we haven't done in weeks. Take a bath. I need a shave. I'm going to try to straighten up my clothes. I went to bed, went back to the concentration camp. <clears throat> About 10 o'clock, in comes this minor car. I saw four stars on the first bumper. I recognized them. General Eisenhower. <coughs> Doug, I need you back. <coughs> I see. Colonel got 
He said, Captain, how long have you been here? I said, well, I haven't opened the gate. Can you tell us from the very buildings? Yes, I can. He goes to General Eisenhower and tells him that. <coughs> I said, well, I suggest the General doesn't want to see that building. It's full of dead bodies. Colonel told Eisenhower that, and Eisenhower said, Open the door, I want to see it. He walked by me and I saluted him. He saluted me back. The sergeant opened the door. General Eisenhower went there and saw those dead bodies, and I saw him doing this. <coughs> General Patton walked up. General Patton got sick in the stomach. He went off to one side. General Badley showed up. He looked at it, pulled out a little book, wrote some notes. Put in this. They made a tour. Finally, they left. I looked at my schedule. Said we're going to take the city of Bamberg tomorrow. Bamberg is 50, 60 miles away. Colonel. Are you going to keep us on that schedule? He said, absolutely. I said, but Bamberg's on the other side of the Danube River from where we are. He said, yeah, you're right. We've already notified the Corps of Engineers. They're going to build a bridge across the Danube River. Good. We started down the road. Sure enough, when I got to Bamberg, to my amazement, Corps of Engineers were already there. The Danube River was running fast, melting snows and increased the volume. A lot of logs and trash were coming down the river. How in the world will they build a bridge across it? They'll carry all these heavy guns and ammunition. But they kept working. I watched them. Look, there's a member of the greatest generation. Young man that yesterday worked in her office. Or yesterday was a farmer. Or yesterday worked in a service station. And there he is. Bamberg, Germany, building a bridge across the Danube River. I watched him for three or four hours. Finally, I saw the colonel drive his vehicle across. The bridge sort of moved, but it was steady. I called my colonel. The bridge has been built, Colonel. We can come forward. I went across the bridge. The Germans had been in Bamberg, surrendered and went the other way. The town was now empty. I drove through the town. The people lined up to see us. You would have thought we were on a parade. They were all standing out there looking at us. But I saw a beautiful home on the hill. Had a fence around it, two big gates. I said, Sergeant, I'll bet that man would like to have a guest tonight. Drive up. We drove up around that long curve and beautiful big home. Sergeant said, anybody will open the door. He goes up and rings the doorbell. A woman dressed like a maid answered the door. Is your master here? No. He's vermouth. He's gone. Is the mistress here? No, she went with him. Who's here? I'm here. The butler's here. And the chauffeur. Did he leave any food? You haven't guessed tonight. <coughs> There's three of us. Go down and get the best German food he's got. Set the table like you said that for a king. Because we want to eat first class. She looked at us in amazement. In a little while, I 
I said, Sergeant. She says, an evening meal is ready. He said, Captain, before you eat, let me show you something. Come down in the basement. Look at this automobile. A pink Mercedes Benz, 12 cylinders. Two seats in the back, one facing this way, one facing that way, and a table in the middle. My goodness. All wood down. What if it'll start? Sergeant said, yes, it'll start, but it's out of gas. Go get a five-gallon can and put it in that vehicle. Turn on the motor. That 12 cylinder was very smooth and quiet. <coughs> Look, Sergeant, that's too nice a vehicle to leave here for the German. <laughs> in the morning, fill up the tank. <coughs> put a driver at the head. <coughs> Don't tell the German, because he wouldn't let us do it. I found out it's best to do it, explain it afterwards, and then can I do it? And he said, no. The next morning, we left Bamberg for Regensburg, a big manufacturing facility. All of the factories had been bombed by American bombers. There were about five or six hundred soldiers that waited for them. As soon as we got there, they began to fire at us. We lost some men immediately. We pulled off the side of the road, <coughs> put our houses in place. We began to fire anything we saw firing at us, we fired back. Hour after hour, we fired. After hour, they fired. We lost some men. They lost more than we did. We had more firepower than they did. Pow, pow, pow. Hour after hour we fought. Finally, the Germans withdrew. They didn't surrender, they just simply went back. We went to Regensburg. <coughs> we did the same. <coughs> we did the same thing. We spent the night in Regensburg. The Colonel had a meeting in the morning. <coughs> Captain Martin, we're going to take Nuremberg. Not only did those Germans go back to Nuremberg, but our Secret Service says that about 1,500 or 2,000 Germans waiting for us. They'll be ready for us when you drive into town, and if you do, you're going to get killed. He said, I've called in the Air Force, and they're going to bomb the town. And they got to notify us by air when the bombing ceases to go in immediately when the bombing stops. Yes, sir. We saw the bombers coming overhead, and I thought, just think, that pilot was a boy in Gaston, Alabama, graduated from Gaston High. Think of that. He comes down. Drops his bombs on Regensburg, plane after plane. Regensburg was just burning in fire. German soldiers had sort of withdrawn. We got orders to advance. <coughs> we started moving forward. When the Germans saw us coming, they moved out. We walked through Regensburg, and there were dead Germans all over the place. We've been very effective. We spent the night in Regensburg. Oh. In the morning, we're going to take Passau, a German town on the edge of Austria. It's where Hitler really got started when he developed the Nazi army. But a man named Hitler came to Passau. And he began to tell everybody what a horrible things the Allies had did to Germany. Let's rise up. The king is not doing anything. Let's overthrow the king. Let's kill him. Hitler made speech after speech, and finally he had large crowds listening to him. They began to think about what they were doing. The Nazi Party was being organized. They drew a swastika as their symbol. They went in and killed the Tsar. They took over. 
if I let him begin to build this big army. 1938. Hitler says there's a little piece of Germany called Regensburg. It's now part of Czechoslovakia. Let's take it back. He got his army and his airplane and his tank and he started driving through to take that part of Germany back. But he didn't stop. He kept going into Czechoslovakia. He took over Czechoslovakia. The British heard about that. Lord Chamberlain was the Prime Minister. He comes to the Parliament and says, I made an appointment with Hitler. I'm going to fly across the channel and meet him tomorrow. He did. But I remember one interesting thing. They told him, I over in the time. Get up 15 minutes. 15 minutes. My gosh, I got to win more in 15 minutes. <laughs> Chamberlain went to see Hitler. Hitler said, listen, Prime Minister, don't worry about Germany. We're not going to bother anybody. We just want it back what was on. Chamberlain goes back and tells the British that. The British got uneasy about his report. Didn't have to wait long, Hitler then went into Poland. When he went into Poland and captured Warsaw, Chamberlain says, oh. And a man by the name of Churchill stood up. And he had been in the, traveled in the military. He knew at that time Great Britain owned a lot of part of the world. Churchill knew about all that. He stood up in Parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Great Britain. We're not going to allow Hitler to take Europe because if he does, he'll come over here. Let's tell Hitler. We'll fight you on the land. We'll fight you on the sea. And we'll fight you in the air. We will never be defeated. But he didn't have what it took to get all of that done. So he gets on the Queen Mary and he sails across the ocean and he makes an appointment with President Roosevelt. Mr. President, we need your help. We need tanks and guns and vehicles and ships and airplanes. Yeah. I think we can furnish that. And America then did America. They closed down General Motors. They closed down Ford. They closed down Chrysler. They made tanks. They made all kind of vehicles for the Army. They quit making ladies' clothes and men's suits and made uniforms. They put a draft to the Congress and to draft young American men. And they did. I was not drafted. I volunteered in March of 41. 41. I was on maneuvers in North Carolina. Old Lieutenant drives up. Did you hear about Pearl Harbor? Where is Pearl Harbor? Pearl Harbor is a big port in Hawaii. The entire Pacific fleet was there. But this morning at 8 o'clock, planes flew off a carrier from Japan and they bombed our whole, whole fleet. We know of some ships that went down. The battleship USS Arizona was hit by a 1,800 pound bomb. It went through the bow of the ship. That's where all the explosives were connected place. The ship exploded. And 1,800 young men went down to the bottom of the ocean with this ship. They are members of the great generation. And next to that was the USS Oklahoma. 
another big ship. It got hit by the Japanese. It sunk over on its side. A lot of men got off and were saved. 400 of them went up out of the ship and they couldn't get out. The ship sunk. 400 young men, members of the greatest generation. Look at that. The whole Pacific fleet is destroyed. No, no. Our aircraft carriers are on a mission. We've got three of them. And we've broken the code of the Japanese Secret Service. We can tell you exactly what the Japanese are going to do. Admiral Nimmin, take your battleship over here and we're going to tell you when to attack. In comes this fleet of Japanese battleships. They didn't know that Admiral Nimmin was sitting here with two carriers and airplanes loaded with American pilots, a lot of them from Alabama. Admiral Nimmin Watch carefully. He had his plane up high in the air. Finally, he saw the Japanese coming. Go! American pilots took off from our carriers, went down on those German ships, wide open airplanes, bullets flying, bombs dropping. Four big carriers. The Japanese turned over to one side sunk to the bottom. One destroyer and two, two other ships were sunk. The rest of them turned around and went back to Japan. The admiral in charge says, we woke up the sleeping child. Hitler surrendered. The Japanese surrendered. The war started. Pearl Harbor, and it ended four years later, and America brought freedom to the world. God bless the men and women who died. They were the greatest generation, but yours is next. You can be the greatest generation, because soon you'll be grown. You'll be taking your place in society. You'll succeed on how well you got educated. Take your lessons seriously. Decide you're going to learn because you want to learn. And decide you're going to succeed because you want to succeed. What little success I've had. I owe it to my teacher. I was blessed with good teacher. They were strict. They were tough. And I got caught a couple of times. Back then, you'd have to carry a bucket of coal in each hand walk around the square. And my mother said, Son, what did you do to make the teacher do that? My oh, mama, I was talking to somebody when the teacher said, Be quiet. Well, she said, You deserve it. Be quiet. I'm going to be quiet, but I want to thank you for letting me be with you, and thank you for listening about the greatest generation, because your generation is going to be greater than our one. God bless you.
They had already come into that part of Europe. The Germans did not want to surrender to the Russians. We rushed in, and all of a sudden we get a notice. They want to surrender. They did. Two weeks later, I'm in the headquarters of our office. The sergeant comes in and says, Captain Martin, there's a long vehicle coming across the Inns River. He says they're from Germany. They're the German army. But they want to surrender to us. Hmm. How many men are you? He said there are about 15,000 of us. We've been all the way to Moscow. And the Russians defeated us. And we've come back and they've been fighting us continuously. They're fighting right now. Colonel, what should we do? Captain Martin, yes. Sir. Cross the bridge at the Hens River. He said the general will be at this crossroad. Tell the general we'll accept the surrender, but he's got to come and park all of his vehicles here, drop all of his weapons, and walk home. Yes, sir. I drove across the Inns River to my amazement. I looked up and I saw these big tanks. And they saw that American flag on my teeth. The German soldiers stood up and left. They were so glad to surrender to America because if they had not, the Russians would have killed them. I went and I met the general. He was well dressed, had a beautiful German. Uniform on, white shirt, green tie. General, do you speak English? Yes, I do. Where did you learn English? He said, I'm a graduate of Harvard University. Oh, in the United States, you went to college. Yes. You're in the regular army, aren't you? Yes. He said, We don't say how Hitler. With a regular German army. As I was driving up, men saw us coming, and my sergeant said, Captain, can I get some food pistol souvenirs? Yeah. Yes, sir. Give it time to stole it. The Germans began to drop the pistols in our teeth. Uh, the general says, Well, I see all the pistols. Captain, do you want mine? General, I didn't come here to get your pistol. I came here to accept your surrender. Is there any questions you have to ask? Yes, he said. You expect me to walk home? Well, no, if you've got wings of an angel, you can fly. But <laughs> well, we're not going to let you have a vehicle. Oh, I'm a general, aren't you? You're not my general. Pat is my general. I'll see you, general. I went back across the Inns River. An hour later, I saw this mass of Germans coming across the bridge, lining up their vehicles. Hour after hour, they came. Finally, I saw them start marching on. We were just 750 men. All of a sudden, there were 15,000 Germans around. We were glad to see them go. All right. The war was over. We had the, the Army of Occupation. We had to deal with the Germans. We had one other problem. All the people had been in those prison camps. All the slave labor, all the men and women that they carried with them in the army were left. We didn't have food to feed them. They all needed a shower, so we made them a shower. We put a drum of water up on the platform and filled it full of water and punched a hole in it and let it drip on down and get under there and take a bath. Times are tough. I stayed one year additional intelligence service. Army was gone home. 
We were dealing with the Russians. I had ordered it at Vienna Hospital. The Russians were tough. Now, then my story by telling you. I was told to take over a hotel and clean it up for my headquarters. American and our forces were in Linz, Austria. The Danube River separated us from the Russians. It was still 125 miles from the big city of Vienna. I drove across the border. A Russian stopped me. He said he wouldn't let me go any further. I said, fine. I read from my pistol. Do you really want to stop us? No. <laughs> Third time. Sergeants, all the men get the rifles out. Cock. That was Russian way going right on through. We did. I got to Vienna, the there was a sea of destruction. The city had been bombed, the Russians had overrun it, they destroyed the stores, they killed men, women, and children. They just took what they wanted. They were half drunk running around the town, and here I drive them. I went to the hotel I was supposed to have cleaned up. The Bristol. I walked into the Bristol and I said, Who's here? One man showed up, Bristol uniform. Who else? Well, there's the two cooks. Good. Tamla picks up this magnificent dining room in the Bristol Hotel. They've got guests. Two years ago, I took some friends to dinner at the Bristol Hotel. And I told him, when I put my credit card down on the counter, he says, have you ever been to Vienna before? Yes. Have you ever stayed at the Bristol? Yes. When was that? 1945. <laughs> he said, I wasn't even born. Now, how was it like? Terrible. <laughs> when I finished the hotel, I was told to get a living quarters where the Russians were to stay in the American zone. I did. We drove through the Vienna woods and I saw this beautiful home. Walls around. Stop. Went up to the gate, there was a button there. I pushed it. 